Welcome to ICCG's Close Up, sponsored by Round World Solutions, where Fortune 1000 CXOs share their enterprise strategies for competing and winning in the global economy. Our wide ranging topics include big data, governance, supply chain analytics, enterprise mobility, and portfolio management. The goal of our interviews is to understand the CXO's area of focus, the challenges associated with that area, and their plans for confronting those challenges. The benefit to our participants is the creation of a virtual CXO knowledge pool, so CXOs can learn from each other and not have to reinvent the wheel. I'm your host, Ellis Booker. Welcome to ICCG's Close Up, sponsored by Round World Solutions, where Fortune 1000 CXOs share their enterprise strategies for competing and winning in the global economy. I'm your host, Ellis Booker. Joining me from Round World to ask questions today is Amy Hara, Vice President, Strategy and Business Development. Hi, Amy. Hi, Ellis. Happy to be here. Our guest today is Tina Lai Lidke. Global Vice President, Marketing and Product Development at Alayer, a global diagnostic device and service provider. Welcome, Tina. Thanks, Ellis. It's great to be here. Tina, can you start us off by describing uh, Alayer's business and the kind of products and services it offers? Sure. So Alir is a leading global rapid diagnostics company. We manufacture and commercialize what are called point-of-care diagnostic tests, and every year we deliver over a billion of these tests to customers in over 100 countries. We focus our business in three main areas, cardiometabolic disease, infectious disease, and toxicology. Our cardiometabolic business addresses disease states such as diabetes and heart failure, and we offer our tests in this area to a wide variety of settings, including hospitals, physician offices, and even to patients in their homes. Our infectious disease business can offer test results for over 75 of these really pandemic illnesses, including HIV and malaria, and we partner with organizations such as the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation and Malaria No More to help them to advance their cause in developing countries. And finally, our toxicology business allows us to very rapidly and accurately test for drugs and alcohol. And so you can imagine that a lot of industries could use these sorts of tests, including employers and government agencies and even occupational health clinics. Uh, the motto that we have at Alir across all of our businesses is the idea that knowing now matters, meaning that having immediate and actionable information can better improve clinical and economic outcomes. Great. That's a terrific uh, description of Allaire. Um, you're in the marketing function and, and product development. Um, tell us about some of the challenges in marketing unique to healthcare right now, especially interested in how uh, modern marketers such as yourself use technology to um, further business goals. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that the overarching challenge that we have in healthcare today, whether you're a clinician, an administrator, or someone like myself who works for a solution provider, is how to deliver higher quality at lower, lower costs. And what that means for us as marketers is that we need to very clearly describe and articulate the value proposition of our products and services to our customers. And we need to make them understand why it is that if they take our solution, that they'll end up with better outcomes over time. And so what we're seeing in my space is the use of systems and data to empirically show that fact, to show that by having your solution, you could lower readmission rates in hospitals, that you can lower the length of stay or improve on other performance metrics and that all of this over time translates into lower cost for the healthcare system or for society in general. 
And I think another trend that we're seeing in healthcare is the move toward more consumer-driven behavior. So because of things like the internet and social media, patients are more aware of their options and they're more educated about the fact that they can take healthcare into their own hands. But the challenge that we have here is that we need to figure out which channels are best to reach them among all the channels available today. So which channels are the most effective to great give them better awareness of the disease states that they have and to educate them on the solutions that we can provide. Uh, there are a lot of companies and platforms out there, but I think the ones that are the most useful are the ones that can allow you to target your intended audience quickly and to be able to see the progress over time that you might have for say an awareness campaign so that you could see really easily how many impressions you're making, how many of those actually turn into leads, and if you can, for instance, dovetail that into a CRM system, you can see how many leads then turn into sales. Right. Um, in terms of your marketing mix, any big changes in the last two, three years at Alera? In other words, um, has print declined, digital increased, and if it's digital, what channels are you finding are performing well for you guys? Yeah, that's also a, a really good question. So we had a big push toward digital for many reasons because I think more and more people are using digital media, but also because it actually saves costs over time versus print. And so we're trying to get everything on iPads. We have very sophisticated what we call folios. They're interactive and they really prove the point back to the point of value, uh, uh, having a, a value discussion when you can show uh, pictorially through some sort of action in your iPad, um, what effect that has on on uh, hospital administration, for instance. Um, I think the the change in mix of our uh, customers at Alir is is quite striking. You can't just think about an end customer being a patient or a clinician. There are the GPOs, there's the buying organizations, there's payers, there's all sorts of stakeholders and you need to convince all of them that you have a good solution. Very good. Um, can you share with us your top two or three priorities for this year? Sure. Well, as the head of global marketing for Alir uh, in our cardiometabolic business unit, my top priority is always to help our teams to keep our business growing and to uh, you know, achieve our revenue targets for the year. But more specifically this year, I've been spending a lot of my time and energy on enterprise-wide initiatives that will help raise the skill sets of our employees and hopefully their performance over time. One of the initiatives that I've uh, embarked on is what I call Launch 360. And that's simply a standardized approach to uh, the way we prepare for and that we execute product launches. It's a set of tools and processes that marketers anywhere in the organization can use to help them to put together the fundamentals of a good product launch. So for instance, the program will take you through how to develop a really good global business plan up front, how to target customers and segment them appropriately, how to scenario build and you know sort of ensure you have all the checks and balances for a good rollout. The other big initiative that I'm uh, involved in has to do with pricing improvement. And like any big company that has been focused on top line growth over the last few years, we can stand to improve in terms of the way that we govern and we execute the way we uh, have pricing policies. And certainly we can improve in the way that we actually set prices around the world. A lot of the way we do this is you know, cost plus um, without looking at the true value of our products. So again, it's back to that whole value discussion. Before we talk in more depth about some of your internal projects, I did want to ask how your priorities um, were influenced by uh, technology themselves. In other words, um, did the, the, the need for pricing um, adjustment across your global span, uh, did that come from a, just a strategic discussion or was there actually a uh, a data-informed piece of that? That's a really great question. I, a little bit of both. So it was a strategic discussion because you know I think that everybody has an awareness that we needed to improve in, in terms of pricing but the, the problem that we face is that we don't have the right systems in place to allow us to analyze 
the data that we have. So it's really hard to to measure or, or to do something we can't measure it. And so uh, one of the things that we realize is that we need better systems. And Alir certainly is a fantastic, I think, a fantastic company. It's grown over the years through many acquisitions. And usually what happens in this sort of situation is that you get a lot of sites with different legacy systems. And it's hard to really harmonize those systems. It takes a lot of manpower and a lot of time and effort in order to do so. So one of the things that we do need to do is to put the infrastructure in place so that we can actually get the data and then be able to analyze it appropriately. Right. You, you mentioned that Alir grew um, through acquisition, over 100 corporate acquisitions. It's now a, what, a $2.5 billion organization. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned a moment ago that uh, that gives you a lot of diverse systems, approaches, strategies, and so forth, different styles of working. Um, for those in the audience watching who might be in a similar bucket, right, do you have any advice uh, either to somebody in marketing or an other CXO role, um, how you can work through those issues um, and not have a palace revolt, I guess, I mean, to do, to do it effectively? Yeah, I think that, you know, the hardest thing to do when you're in the type of organization that's very complex and, and, and large and has morphed over time is to try to rise above the noise of daily activity and to really identify a goal and to kind of move the organization toward that common goal. And so what I've done uh, at Alir to try to help in this regard is to team up with other leaders across the organization to identify what are the big areas of improvement that we have, whether it be you know, improvement in demand forecasting or the way that we do product portfolio management, and then to put our heads together to try to understand how we do things today and then how can we do things better. And you know, I think when you get the momentum of a lot of like-minded leaders in the organization, you can make that change. So the advice I would have for someone who's uh, in this type of situation and wants to be an agent for change, so to speak, is, is a, a few things. So I would say, first of all, to keep it simple, uh, whatever solution you have, you know, you should make it simple enough for people to follow and understand. Of course, you have to be detailed enough, but you don't want to add complexity to an already complex situation. Um, and it's really important to have advocacy and support. So support from the highest levels of the organization. I find that having uh, a sponsorship at, a, at the, sort of the very, very highest levels will help your cause uh, and go a long way when you're actually trying to implement this across structures and reporting lines. Uh, same thing with uh, your partner. So make sure you have really uh, strong cross-functional partners that believe in your cause and that can you know, take your messages and distill them down through their organizations. And I think finally I would say that, you know, just be patient. These things take time and um, sometimes changes like this require a massive cultural shift in the way that people do things or have been doing things for many, many years. So don't expect things to change overnight. And when you're trying to implement a solution, try to build in things like a phased approach so you can take those baby step changes or try to build in redundancies. You might want to train people multiple times to really hone in the messages that you want them to internalize. But the advice about being patient is, uh, is terrific. And Amy has been patient as I've been dominating the questioning. So um, Amy, I'm sure you have a couple of questions for Tina as well. Go ahead. I sure do. Hi, Tina. Hi. So this is sort of a follow-up on Ellis's uh, last question that he just asked and I understand that you have a global role and have worked with colleagues and customers around the world and of course today we live in a global economy and must learn to collaborate with those uh, who have different business and cultural norms in your experience how have you successfully navigated global environments to achieve your business goals well, I think one of the most important things that you can do when you work in a global organization is to try not to be ethnocentric. So, you know, you need to realize and acknowledge that the way that people do business and whether cultural norms are is it could be it could be very different than the way you do things and what your cultural norms are. So, you know, there's no one size fits all and the way you do things may not be the best solution for everyone. 
Uh, you need to put yourself in your colleagues and your customers' shoes and think about what's common between them and what's different. And you know, try to adapt to their way of doing things so that you can speak a common language rather than trying to make them adapt to the way you do things. I think that you'll find that when when you do this, that uh, you know, people will be much more responsive to you, and they'll begin to trust you and 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 follow along with what you're trying to achieve much more readily. Uh, what I try to do as well is to really instill this kind of thinking with my team, um, and and I th I also find that what helps is to meet and work in person. So you know, while today. Uh, in this modern age, we have great technology that allows us to work virtually together. You know, I think that there's nothing like having uh, met someone in person, shaking their hand, and you know, having a side conversation with them that will really go a long way in terms of um, advancing your working relationship and your understanding of each other. So, if you need to get on an 18-hour flight to meet someone, then consider doing it because it's usually really appreciated, and then it'll go really far. Uh, that was a great and candid and I think important uh, final answer. It will have to be the final answer because we've simply run out of time. Uh, thank you for watching ICCG's Close Up sponsored by Round World Solutions. To see more of our interviews, join the discussion or be a participant yourself in one of the interviews, uh, please visit the website at ICCGUSA.com. Thanks for listening. Hello, I'm Amy Hara, Vice President of Solutions and Delivery for Round World Solutions, the experts in integrated governance with project execution with a focus on big data solutions. Our unique 360-degree view enables us to give CXOs a comprehensive view of where they are today, where they would like to be, and delivers a powerful framework to encompass change management structures to ensure they accomplish their goals. ICCG Close-Up is an interview panel where Fortune 1000 CXOs share their views on big data, governance, and their most pressing issues. At the conclusion of the interviews, we'll be compiling the results into an industry and issue-specific report to share with all of the interviewees emphasizing common interests and future plans associated with those interests across industries. The benefits to our participating CXOs are the creation of a virtual CXO interactive knowledge base, highly scaled shared resources, and the ability to learn from each other without having to reinvent the wheel. Thank you for watching ICCG's Close Up, sponsored by Round World Solutions. For more information about our CXO interview panel or to join the conversation, please visit us at www.roundworldsolutions.com. Thank you.